Greetings everyone, welcome to Spacing Out. I'm Maureen Ellsbury. And I'm Alejandro Rojas. Thank you for joining us. We're here to get you caught up on the news, so here are some of the space and UFO stories that have made headlines recently. In a recent interview with ABC Sydney, Shirley MacLaine says she took former Australian ambassador to the United States, Andrew Peacock, UFO spotting, and they did indeed spot UFOs. McLean appeared on ABC Radio in Sydney for an interview about her upcoming one-woman show and other topics. Among these topics discussed was, of course, one of her favorites, UFOs. McLean is well known for her UFO and paranormal interests and has gone UFO spotting with many prominent people. Perhaps the most famous being the UFO she saw with Dennis Kucinich. When asked about the sighting during a presidential debate, Kucinich didn't deny it. Instead, he replied, you have to keep in mind that more people in this country have seen UFOs than I think approve of George Bush's presidency. During the radio interview, the ABC announcer asked, Is it true, though, Shirley, that you took Andrew Peacock, our former foreign minister, that you took him UFO spotting? McLean replied, Yes, we went to Mexico to Mount Popocatepetl because there were having so many UFO sightings, and we don't know really why. But we saw them, and he did too. The ABC announcer then asked, how did Andrew Peacock respond to the sighting of a UFO? McLean said, he was very open to everything. I tried to get him to talk about Alice Springs and things like that, but he was very loyal to his Foreign Service oath of secrecy. Alice Springs presumably is referring to the satellite tracking station commonly known as Pine Gap, which is about 11 miles southwest of Alice Springs. It is run by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, the U.S. National Security Agency, and the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office for Global Surveillance, or so they say. Some suspect that it has ties with secret UFO research or perhaps even alien technology. McLean did not give details as to what she and Peacock spotted on the radio program. In her book, I'm All Over That, published in 2011, she wrote of the UFO sighting. On a UFO stakeout in Mexico near Mount Popocatepetl, at one moment we thought we saw a craft and Andrew nearly climbed the sky to see if it was real. In her book, McLean says her relationship with Peacock was her longest lasting relationship with a political leader. She says Peacock never told her UFOs had anything to do with extraterrestrials, but he also said and did nothing to disabuse her of such a belief. Scientists from the UK and Greece found something interesting in a piece of the Nakhla meteorite which fell to Earth in 1911 in Egypt. Dr. Elias Chatsi Theodoritis of the National Technical University of Athens first discovered the unusual feature embedded within the chunk of meteorite. He contacted his colleague, Professor Ian Lyon, at the University of Manchester to get his take on the odd structure. In many ways, it resembled a fossilized biological cell from Earth, but it was intriguing because it was undoubtedly from Mars, explains Lyon. Our research found that it probably wasn't a cell, but that it did once hold water, water that had been heated probably as a result of an asteroid impact. The team's discovery is significant because it adds more evidence to support the notion that Mars has or had the right conditions to support life beneath its surface. If large asteroids hit Mars in the past, as the evidence suggests, researchers believe it created long-lasting hydrothermal fields that warm the subsurface of Mars, making it a habitable environment. We have been able to show the setting is there to provide life, Lyon explains. It's not too cold, it's not too harsh. Life as we know it, in the form of bacteria, for example, could be there, although we haven't found it yet. It's about piecing together the case for life on Mars. It may have existed and in some form could still exist. Astrobiology.com reports that the team plans to investigate other materials in the meteorite sample in search of possible biological signatures that will provide scientific evidence of life on Mars, past or present. The team's recent findings are published in the journal Astrobiology in a paper titled A Conspicuous Clay Ovoid in Nakla, Evidence for Subsurface Hydrothermal Alteration on Mars with Implications for Astrobiology. A UFO appeared in the skies above Northern California in the early morning of Friday, September 12th. At least 30 witnesses in the Bay Area watched a strange object streak across the sky at approximately 6 a.m. Some described the object as a white light, while others say it was orange, but the light was seen with a fog or smoke billowing out behind it. 
Among the witnesses is a police officer from Sacramento. KPIX San Francisco CBS affiliate spoke with Bing Kwok of Morrison Planetarium at the California Academy of Science to ask him about the UFO. Looking at the website of the American Meteor Society, it looks like there are several reports of a large bright object falling through the sky, he explains. It's rather unusual in that this one had a rather large tail following behind it, Kwok points out. The station also checked with Gerald McKeegan of the Chabot Space and Science Center in Oakland. We're thinking maybe it was either a piece of space junk that has fallen out of orbit and into our atmosphere, or it might have been some kind of missile test launch, he suggested. But when KPIX checked with Vandenberg Air Force Base, base representatives informed the station that there were no launches that morning. One witness explained, this morning when I was leaving for work, before I got into my car, I noticed that there was some type of object in the air with a type of floodlight on, and white fog slash smoke was billowing out of it, as if something was being sprayed into the air. I tried to take a photo with my iPhone, but it didn't come out. Could this be fogging for mosquitoes? I was a bit concerned because the object was clearly spraying some substance into the air with the floodlight on. Then the light went off and I couldn't see or hear the sounds from a plane or anything. It was very strange. But local daily news website, claycord.com, explains that mosquito fogging in that area is done by truck, not by aircraft. Further, no mosquito fogging was planned for the day in question. Additionally, the fact that the UFO was seen by witnesses in other states, including Nevada and Oregon, rules out this possible explanation. The strange object that streaked across the sky remains unidentified. UFO and government secrecy researcher John Greenwald has been petitioning to get the National Security Agency, or NSA, UFO files that were released in the 90s further declassified. When they were released after a legal battle, much of the information was redacted. There are large swaths of information that have been blacked out or covered with whiteout. However, the NSA recently told Greenwald they could not find even one original of the hundreds of pages of UFO files. Greenwald received this information in response to a request for a mandatory declassification review, or MDR, of the NSA's UFO files. MDRs require that the agency re-review previously released redacted files to unredact information that is now declassified. This is a similar process that was used to reveal the name of Area 51 in CIA documents last year. The MDR was fulfilled for an affidavit related to the lawsuit asking the NSA to release its UFO files in 1980 called the Yates Affidavit. As for the rest, the NSA writes, with the exception of the enclosed document, we cannot locate unredacted copies of the original documents that were previously reviewed and released to the public. The NSA had a large amount of UFO files, not necessarily because they were investigating UFOs, but because they monitor communications worldwide as part of their regular duties. These files are called communications intelligence. Among this large amount of data, there were hundreds of files referring to UFOs. However, the NSA felt they should remain classified. In 1980, Eugene F. Yates, chief of the Office of Policy for the NSA, submitted a 21-page document to the judge overseeing the case, Federal Judge Gerhard A. Gessel, as to why these files should remain classified. This is the Yates Affidavit. However, this document was also classified. Although Gessel did not have the clearance to read the documents in question, the Yates Affidavit convinced him that the NSA files should stay classified. He wrote, the public interest in disclosure is far outweighed by the sensitive nature of the materials and the obvious effect on national security their release may well entail. When the Yates Affidavit was released, it was heavily redacted. UFO researcher Stanton Friedman shows a page from the document to demonstrate government UFO secrecy and as he says, this goes over well on television where a simple image can be very effective when making a point. Eventually, in 1997, due to laws making it more difficult to keep files over 25 years old classified, the NSA released a less redacted Yates affidavit and 156 UFO documents. As Friedman puts it, the affidavit was originally about 75% blacked out, and the second version was only about 20% blacked out. However, the UFO documents are heavily redacted. The NSA must have seen Friedman's talks or television interviews because instead of mostly blacking out the text, 
This time they largely widened it out, making it much less visually poignant. Grunewald writes, in essence, the originals were destroyed or lost when they blacked out the records many years ago. And now in 2014, they are missing and cannot be further reviewed for declassification and release. The history, whatever it may be, is lost forever. And I mean, there could be many reasons why this has occurred. You could think of, we could go the more conspiracy route, that they really just don't want the public to know these, uh, what's in those files, so they've destroyed them. You could go the route where they just were tired of dealing with UFO requests and decided to lie. Yeah. Wouldn't be a huge shocker. Yeah. Or, or three, that some idiot just misplaced them. Yeah, the hard part is there was this big lawsuit. Um, they have a whole website to get mm -hmm. dedicated to UFO files. So they knew the public had a big interest right. in these files, but they still lost them or got rid of them. That is really difficult to understand. And it really, if they're trying to avoid these, these people blaming them of conspiracies, this doesn't really lend doesn't well, well towards that, yeah. Right, and I always, I, I mean, this might be kind of a little ridiculous comparison, but this is what flashes through my mind when I think of this, is putting the um, Ark of the Covenant away in <laughs> Indiana Jones, how mm -hmm. they just file it away yeah. in this huge warehouse, and most likely they're all just labeled top secret and you can't find uh, where anything is. Yeah. Not saying that's what happened with this Strange but it very well files, may but. be possible. I mean, who's going to go in and check, you know, unless yeah. you really do, which has happened before, uh, a, a larger lawsuit to really go after right. it. But that's not even guaranteeing you're going to find anything. But you got to um, lend a lot of respect to John Greenwald. He's done some amazing Definitely. things, getting lots of different information, yeah. and he he dedicates a lot of his life to, yeah. to this cause. And, you know, we have been able to get bits and pieces out of documents before, and hopefully mm. we'll continue to be able to do that, just yeah. unfortunately, not this chunk. Yeah, what Greenwald does is so important, and this is a great example, and uh, really hats off to Greenwald. I think this is a really important story, and I think the work he does is, is just uh, so important. And then uh, the website is governmentsecrets.com of his that Correct. lists a lot of these files. And the Black Vault. And the Black Vault, of course. Mm -hmm. but specifically yeah. some of these files, yep. yeah. Yep. All right, well, last week we told you about a strange diamond-shaped UFO allegedly photographed by a witness in New Jersey. Here with an update on that story is Jason McClellan. If you watched the previous episode of Spacing Out, you probably remember that bizarre diamond-shaped UFO a witness observed and photographed in the New Jersey borough of Sayreville as it moved through the sky at treetop level. He sent his photos of the strange object to the Mutual UFO Network and filed a UFO sighting report. He even sent an illustration he made to provide more detail. But one day after MUFON posted the sighting to its website, a commenter posted a link to a YouTube video from more than a year ago showing what appears to be the exact same diamond-shaped UFO. The video was reportedly shot in Colombia, and it shows a UFO drifting through the sky. During the video, you can occasionally make out something hanging below the object, which is a good indication that this object is just a hot air balloon. The commenter who posted the link on MUFON's site notes that at approximately the 32 second mark, the video frame is virtually identical to the UFO photos provided by the alleged witness in New Jersey. So what does that mean? Well, it could mean the exact same UFO, or hot air balloon, appeared in New Jersey during the exact same weather conditions as when it appeared in Colombia, and the witness just happened to be at the exact same vantage point as the person who recorded the video in Colombia. Or, it could mean that the alleged witness in New Jersey is full of hot air. Is it possible that the witness in New Jersey actually snapped the photos he submitted to MUFON? Sure. But evidence does suggest that it's more likely he snagged still images from the Columbia video and submitted a false UFO sighting report. Hoaxing is a sad reality in the UFO field, and it adds difficulty to the already difficult task of identifying the legitimate cases of mysterious aerial objects that merit further investigation. That's all for this episode of Spacing Out. Remember to visit our website, openminds.tv, for all the latest UFO news. Also, don't forget to register for the 2015 International UFO Congress, which is the largest annual UFO conference in the world, and it takes place February 18th through the 22nd in Fountain Hills, Arizona. All the event's information is at ufocongress.com. 
If you enjoyed today's show, make sure to click on the like button, leave us your comments, and subscribe to our channel. If you like podcasts, you can download our podcast, Open Minds UFO Radio, on iTunes or at openminds.tv forward slash radio. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm Alejandro Rojas. And I'm Marina Ellsbury. We'll see you in the future.